In this exciting episode of the Perry Pod, we witness something new for the show an actual murder! And that's just in the episode's first five minutes. It's season one, episode 33 of Perry Mason The Case of the Long Legged Models. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy. My purpose here, pretty simple. Provide an audio and companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series, and as time permits, I'll take a look at some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I give a brief refresher of the plot. If the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. And next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the Law Library! Each episode in the Law Library, we return to prior cases to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. The case of the long-legged models features a client with which Perry already has a relationship, Michael Garvin Sr., Let's review the other episodes that have revealed Perry's prior relationship and how they've led him to clients. Good friend Louise Marlowe connected Perry to falsely accused Faye Allison in the case of the Crimson Kiss. Louise Marlowe, we'll put her on. Louise, what are you doing in town? Perry's patronage of Maury's restaurant in the case of the moth-eaten mink led him to defend Maury. And his sister-in-law. Miss Street. Mr. Mason. Hello, Maury. How's it going, Maury? Fine. I have your table already. Perry's work for Bob Finchley, the victim of a hit-and-run accident in the case of the cautious coquette, led him to defend Elaine Barton for murder. I don't understand, Mr. Mason. I stood in that corner for at least 20 minutes. I didn't see a soul. From the way you described this Elaine Barton, I would have noticed her. There's always the chance she came along as you crossed the street. And Perry's wartime connection to Frank Lawton ends up with Perry defending Frank for murder in the case of the half-wakened wife. Signed Frank Lawton. Lawton? Oh, I remember. He was lieutenant in your company during the war. Isn't he the one that wanted to be the writer? That's the one. Perry's the kind of friend you'll want to have. He's even the kind of friend you want your friends to have if you don't have time to hobnob with a fancy schmancy L.A. legal expert. Now, without further ado, let's get to the plot of this episode. The case of the long-legged models. We open on a man gambling and losing. Seven, you lose. Sorry, Mr. Faulkner. Hey, I won. How about my two dollars? There it is, lady, right in front of you. Glad I brought you luck. Wish it could be more, Joe, but that taps me out. Soon he's writing an apologetic letter to his daughter. Well, the old man did it again. And after all the promises I made, there's really no excuse except that I felt lucky. No matter how desperate he appears, he's not close to giving in to Frank Castle, a chiseler who looks like his face is made out of granite and who wants property that Papa Faulkner owns. When Papa Faulkner won't play nice, Castle gets lethal. You're a tough man to deal with, Faulkner. Wouldn't be surprised if Stephanie was a lot easier. Now don't be foolish, Castle. Listen, no wait. Next thing we know, Castle is pressuring Faulkner's daughter, Stephanie. But it's not just Stephanie who Castle pressures. 
Stephanie's former beau, the newly married Michael Garvin Jr., gets a punch in the breadbasket when he tries to defend Stephanie. I hear tell he's kind of nuts about Stephanie himself. I guess it runs in the family, huh? Why, you... What's the matter? Can't you take it down there? Looks like it's time for Papa Garvin to step in. He takes Stephanie to his old pal and lawyer, Perry Mason. Who is this George Castle, Mike? I think he killed Stephanie's father. How do you know? I just got back from Vegas. I traced your father's movements the night he was killed. He'd been gambling heavily, going from place to place. And in every place, George Castle was somewhere in the background. First step, scare Castle to death. And Mason does just that. All right, Mason. I'll pay you $1,500. Where do we go from here? I'm going to get a bad taste out of my mouth. Then someone literally puts Castle to death. And Mason sees Stephanie leaving the building just in time to pick her up and say ta-ta to the gallant Lieutenant Trag. Well, it's been uh, nice meeting you, Miss... Uh... Well, it's uh, still been nice. Next, we see Mason pull a little razzle-dazzle with some guns. He knows that Stephanie has Papa Garvin's holster gun with a bullet missing. Uh-oh, time to find a decoy. Fortunately, Papa Garvin buys his guns in bulk and his identical ones in his vault and in the possession of his son. So when Perry gets a hold of the junior pistol, he does what any lawyer would naturally do, which is accidentally fire the gun into Junior's desk, return the gun to Junior, then take the shaken car salesman to Stephanie's apartment where Junior hands her the gun. Cool, right? Until the cops arrest Stephanie and discover that the gun in her possession was the murder weapon. Say what? So clever, I put a noose right around Stephanie's neck. Court case revolves around Papa Garve's three guns. Explain it for us, Hamilton. Let's try this. Let's call the gun that you gave your son, Michael Garvin Jr., the Junior Gun. Let's call the one that you keep in your safe or vault, the Vault Gun. And let's refer to the one that you habitually carry on your person as the Holster Gun. Is that clear? The other complication? It seems that Papa Garve loves Stephanie. And, well, Stephanie, she loves Papa Garve. You know how we know? They were covering for each other! Why did you substitute the vault gun for the holster gun? Because I I thought she killed Mr. Castle with it. In self-defense, of course. Nothing says true love like suspecting the object your affections of committing murder, albeit of a murderer. It turns out the real culprit is Eva, the red-headed secretary of Papa Gar. She had a record. Castle knew about it. She felt the only way out was to get him. I didn't mean to frame you, Stephanie. You've got to believe that. I was just trying to make something of myself. I was trying, but George Castle wouldn't let me. He just wouldn't let me. In our denouement, Stephanie and Papa Garve get hitched. Junior tries to sell Mason a car. As for the title, well, apparently Castle owned stock in a Las Vegas clothing store that preferred long-legged models. Julie's, what's that? Sure tell you're a bachelor. It's a swank women's shop in Vegas, the kind of a place where they have long-legged models. If you're a smart shopper, you might be able to pick up a little cotton frock for about $200. Margot Garvin worked there. Eva, too. Are they long-legged? I guess. Who can tell, especially with Eva wearing hats like the one she has on in that final court scene? Nobody's looking at her legs. They're trying to figure out if... You can put, like, plates and other flatware on that hat. The 1958 novel on which the episode was based has some differences from the television adaptation that are worth noting. First, consider that Gardner published this novel well into the first season of the show. Presumably, he should know what the television writers want. Well, he finally does give us a courtroom confession in the novel. Eva confesses on the stand... This is the first novel I've read with that happening. But Gardner begins the novel with Mason, so we don't get anything as dramatic as the opening television scene. This is despite the fact that the show never begins with Perry. Gardner apparently just doesn't care. 
Second, note that in the book, Stephanie Faulkner is every bit the long-legged model that Junior's new wife and Junior's former girlfriend, Eva, are. The title basically refers to the kind of women Junior Garvin likes. In the television adaptation, the defendant, Stephanie Faulkner, looks like she could be the sister of the defendant in the case of the Green-Eyed Sister. Third, Eva is really different in the book. There's no sympathetic Kansas story here. Eva in the novel wants to be an actress and thinks herself a secretary in the movie. She's been paying blackmail the castle and finally wants it to stop. That's the motive for murder. Fourth, in the show, the bullet mysteriously disappears from Junior's desk without a trace. In the novel, it's clear that it's Della who went and retrieved that bullet, law-defying Della. Now, let's get trivial, shall we? Each episode in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. Paul is a subject worth investigating more. A Della is something about a particular character in the story. A Perry is something we learn about our main character. Our Paul this episode concerns Las Vegas real estate. We get a lot of numbers thrown around because it's clear that Marty Davis and his crew, i.e. the mob, want to build a casino where the Faulkner-owned hotel stands. Castle offers $500 a front foot. Perry wants $1,500 a front foot. The research prompt for this episode. How much was real estate actually selling for in casino territory in Las Vegas? How much would it go for now? Ardella, this episode concerns Lyle Talbot, a.k.a. Michael Garvin Sr., Funny you didn't know that, Mr. Garvin. Oh, well, just a minute, young man. What's that supposed to mean? Now relax, Mike. Now this cat led a super interesting life. Born in 1902 in a small town in Nebraska, he bolted from his hometown in 1918 to serve as a magician's assistant in a traveling circus. He worked in a traveling theater troupe, starred in a host of pre-code talky movies, then worked alongside big-name stars like Humphrey Bogart and Carol Lombard. The dude was one of the founding members of the Screen Actors Guild. Over 150 movie credits. Tons of TV shows. B-movies? Yep. Cult classics? Yep. Early 50s TV? You better believe it. Including recurring roles on The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet and The Bob Cummings Show. One reason we know all this? In 2012, Talbot's daughter Margaret, a writer for The New Yorker, wrote a book that examined her father's career as a synecdoche for 20th century popular entertainment. It's called The Entertainer, Movies, Magic, and My Father's 20th Century. As for Talbot's son, David? All he did was found Salon.com. Some family, David and Margaret were Lyle's kids from his final marriage, married four times between 1930 and 1948, Lyle was married to the mother of his four children for 41 years until she died in 1989. He lived to 1994. Wow, that was a fun one to discover, frankly. And our period this week concerns our intrepid hero's car. After all, this is the episode where Junior is trying to sell him a new one. What car is Perry rocking in his scenes with Stephanie Faulkner? That would be a 1958 Ford Fairlane convertible. And what kind of car is Junior peddling? A Ford, of course, but this one is a mode docking machine, the 1958 Ford Thunderbird. And he'll have fun, fun, fun until Perry takes the T-Bird away. Our theme for this episode is bad breaks. There's Stephanie's bad break with her father's murder. Why don't you lay off her castle? She's had a bad break. Her father's been murdered. There's Perry's bad break, when the police find the wrong gun in Stephanie's apartment. There's the bad break for Eva, when her luck can't hold out and she gets tabbed for the murder. I thought my luck would hold out just this once, but, but it never has. And as always, there's the defendant's bad break of being at the wrong place at the wrong time and getting charged with a murder she didn't commit. The show is sympathetic to those who experience bad breaks. It's built around the premise that every defendant is falsely accused. 
That's as bad a break as one cat can get. Yet, hope shines through. Stephanie finds Papa Garvin. Junior Garvin just might find himself a new customer. Now it's time for a Perry proverb. This episode's moment of wisdom shows Perry directing his vigilante-prone client to gulp the cops. I think you're being childish, Mike. As your attorney, I suggest you turn your information and theories over to the authorities in Las Vegas. Wait a minute. Perry wants Papa Garvin to go to the authorities in Las Vegas? Maybe Perry knows something we don't about the reliability of the Nevada cops and DAs. Surely they're not beholden to the mob. Perry likes his justice handed out officially. Don't take your gun to town, Garv. Leave your gun at home, Mike. Now let's grab a swig from the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Our research prompt from the last episode, the case of the substitute face, concerned territorial waters. How exactly do they work? Where do American territorial waters begin and Canada's end? Would cruise ships sailing then or now in the Pacific would be owned and operated by Great Britain? Was that specious arguing on Perry's part? Here's the way it works. If you're within 12 nautical miles of a nation, you're in that nation's territory and subject to its laws. Those are the proverbial territorial waters. Since 1982, that law has been in effect and overseen by the United Nations. Now, the traditional distance for territorial waters was three nautical miles because that was the distance of a cannon shot. If you're interested in what international waters are beyond those borders, well, you're under the law of the flag the cruise ship flies under. This is why the question about jurisdiction is crucial, because the cruise ship, in the case of the substitute, faces British. Had she been on international waters when the crime was committed, Mrs. Hauser would have been tried in Great Britain, not California. Aunt Myra, as always, did a little bit of work and found that Canard Line, a cruise line, ran ships in the U.S. and Canada during the mid-1950s. But in 1958, she discovered transatlantic passenger ships dropped in popularity because of commercial airliners. The ship names? Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. Thanks for the help, Aunt My. As always, I love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something about this episode that you'd like to comment on? Something that you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. All Perrypod episodes are available via Spotify and YouTube as well as iTunes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Next time we meet the man behind the Brent building, Mr. Brent himself. And shocker, he's newly married and newly charged with murder. It's the case of the Gilded Lily. Join me, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, keep on walking that Park Avenue beat. Beat.